Well, well, <laughs> Freud was right. <laughs> Welcome to the second episode of Cinema Decon, deconstructing and overthinking the movies of our younger years. My name is Steve Epley, and on this podcast, we will revisit the movies that we keep in the back part of our minds as flawless masterpieces, untouchable by any criticism, and hopefully they stay that way. Join us as we rewatch a randomly selected movie from our list of 300 plus from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. With me on this journey is my co-host, who would never light up a cigar before the fat lady saying, Aaron, how are you tonight, Aaron? I am doing excellent tonight, Steve. Uh, it's been a really long week, so I'm glad to be able to sit down and actually uh, talk about movies for a change. Yeah, it's been about a week since we since we met up and been, been looking forward to talking about uh, this week's movie. Mm, yes, a staple classic from the mid to late 90s. So as we embark on this second episode of Cinema Decon, we want to send a big thank you to everyone who has taken the time to listen to our first cuts, multiple cuts of, of terrible cuts, and provided feedback on all the things. Our friends Bud, Jamal, Pete, Michelle, who is my wife, Michael, my dad, a lot of people out there uh, provided some good feedback out there for us. And hopefully we can use it or ignore it, either or. Oh, is ignoring it an option? Excellent. Yes. I vote for that. Yes. (laughs) If they tell us to be funnier, we may ignore that. Anyone who thinks they know more about movies than Steve and I obviously don't know what they're doing. (laughs) Don't be yourself. Why would you do that? <laughs> I mean, so far, the, the process for me has been been pretty fun. I've learned a lot about the, the editing process and just the recording process, and it's just been a lot of fun in my, my spare time, pretty much spicing things up to make Aaron and I sound a lot better than, than we actually are. Hearing yourself is a bit weird when you're, when you're doing the editing process. That's going to take some getting used to. But I think, I think it turned out all right. Uh, we've been able to put out uh, a trailer so for those out there that haven't listened to our episode zero trailer, you know, please do. Uh, I think it turned out okay. And due to that trailer, we are now available on all major podcast outlets. So your, your Apple, your Google, your Stitcher, your uh, Deezer, and uh, there's a million other. There's, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Did you just make some of those up? Yes, maybe. Okay. <laughs> all words are made up. Now you're just making up words. To follow up on the feedback, though, we do want to clear up a few things, and specifically what happened when we spun the wheel after Coneheads. So we are using a Google random number generator that, that picks a random number between 1 and 351, which is our list. And I spun it twice, but I screwed up because each time it was set to default, which is 1 through 10. Minimizing the odds rather drastically at that point. Yes, but one through ten does not get it out of the A's. So, yeah, we would have a really short podcast run if we uh, didn't realize that setting was there. <laughs> so, so we did it right the the last time. Came up with our with this week's movie and enjoyable process all around. We also received some feedback on the lack of background for us as far as who who I am and who Aaron is. So to to give some more background on that. Uh, I do come from rural Illinois, and at 18, I left and joined the Army. Did four years active and uh, several years with call-ups and National Guard after that. Ended up in D.C., ended up in Iraq, ended up all kinds of places. And it was in Iraq that I met our mutual friend, Bud, who, after I got out of the military, brought me down to Atlanta. And that is where I ran into Mr. Aaron. For my story, I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas, spent pretty much, I want to say 22, it was either 22 or 23 years, it was so long ago, for lack of a better word, stuck in Wichita. Um, It is described as one of those black hole cities where no matter how hard you try to get out, it always pulls you back in. And that was proved (laughs) a couple times to me after I uh, went overseas back in 2001. Uh, right after 9-11, and lived for about a year and a half in Qatar. Uh, for those that don't know, it's a small peninsula off Saudi Arabia. Um, it's also where Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom were originally run from, the base that I was working on. So I was doing some contractor support for the Army there. Transferred over in 03 to an Air Force base in Afghanistan. 
and then uh, came back to live in Wichita, a.k.a. Black Hole, uh, up until 06 when I finally had enough of it and wanted to get out, primarily because the IT industry in Wichita is not the greatest. Uh, if you're not in aircraft or medicine, it, it's not the best place to be. Uh, there's really nothing wrong with the city. It's just primarily an aircraft and, med- and medical town. To add on to, to Aaron's thing there, when we met up in, in Atlanta through our mutual friend, we all became defense contractors. And we ended up rotating in, of the, in and out of the Middle East for seven, ten years. Yeah, off and on. Yeah. Both local and... Yeah, ended up through Bagram, Kandahar, Baghdad, all the fun night spots. Yeah, went through yeah, there. Not to mention the lovely local spots of uh, Camp Lejeune. <laughs> and that's really the only lovely one. I guess Pendleton wasn't so bad. Being able to go to Disneyland oh, was yeah. a nice yeah. touch. Everyone, because let's be honest, everyone wants Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. <laughs> <laughs> so in all those travels and in our various ways, movies were always there. Anytime you're overseas, there is the shared drive that has many, many movies that you can do, you know, in your downtime, you just, just pull one onto your laptop and go ahead and watch it. Or, uh, or if you're real hung up, you go to the local uh, store and get some bootlegs. You know, if you, can, if you can handle someone standing up in the middle of the theater and walking out, you know, in the middle of your shot. Not to mention uh, multiple language subtitles that you can't <laughs> oh, yeah. read. Yeah, look, I knew I should have learned Russian. And let's not forget all the hours we spent sitting on the floor of random Middle Eastern airports waiting for mm-hmm. our... Uh, military flights just going through maybe we could probably fit two, three movies in one sitting waiting for those flights. Cause we'd have to get to the airport at maybe two, 3 AM and it would be five hours before we were able to get on one of those planes. Yeah. There'll be many movies on our list that when it goes back to a, you know, what recollection or memory do you have of that film? It's going to flash back to me to either somewhere defense contractor or somewhere military. You know, there's a lot of these movies just have, bring up the fond memories of those days. Fond memories. <laughs> that was air quotes for everybody who's not watching us on TV. It's hard to portray air quotes through a podcast. Yeah, they weren't all bad. There she is. Hey, there's, there's my wife and we're live streaming. Say hi. Mrs. Epley. She can't hear me though. I will say my wife has not given me a five-star review on iTunes yet. And probably will not. She doesn't even have the app yet. (laughs) Have fun, guys. Before we jump, I'm out of of liquid. I'm going to grab a a liquid. Got me some podcast juice. All right. The lady's gone. (laughs) No girls allowed. God. For today's episode of Cinema Decon, we will be discussing the 1996 blockbuster Independence Day, starring Will Smith, Jeff Goldblum, and Bill Pullman. Aaron, what do you remember about this movie? Oh, my God. I worked, my first job was at a small movie theater in Wichita between junior and senior year of high school. And it just so happened, that was the biggest movie that came out while I was working there. I worked there, I, I can date when I worked there based on the movies that came out. I started when Paul Bears was in the theater. Cause I remember as I was waiting for my interview, I, they had me go sit in the theater and I watched maybe 20 minutes of Paul Bear. Still haven't seen that movie other than that 20 minutes of it. Uh, and then I ended literally, I, I quit literally the night that Kingpin got cut. We, we, they had gotten the reels from Kingpin in and they wouldn't let me come in since I had quit the day, the night before, even though I was dating the girl that uh, also worked there, I couldn't come in as her plus one. Uh, but independence day, was one of the big movies that came in while I was there. I watched that movie so many freaking times for free. I remember clearly seeing this one in the theaters. Uh, it was it was big. I mean, the the media market oh, yeah. for it. I mean, the commercials blowing up the White House. Everyone was was you know. I, this was probably the first movie I waited waited in line for. It was a very good trailer. This it, I remember like the trailer for it didn't give much about the movie other than showing them sh- having them show up. And then the White House explodes and everybody's jaw basically drops. Like, <gasps> so that was pretty, that was pretty intense. I, I have seen that within the past five years. I think I rewatched it when the uh, terrible sequel came out. And I did not rewatch it when the terrible sequel came out. I just watched the terrible sequel and then did some tantric chanting to try to gain those two hours of my life back. 
So this will be interesting. I, I probably haven't watched that movie since early 2000s, I want to say. Because that was, that was 95, 96, right? That would have been 96. Um, I have that. I have that in our list somewhere. 96. Right. We will see you again when we go back and watch Independence Day. Yeah, let's kick the tires and light the fires, Big Daddy. The 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday. But as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. So we watched Independence Day. Again. Again. And again, a couple times. How can you not? Exactly. I just put it on a loop. There's no sugarcoat in this one. That was that was a great movie. Ah, uh, yes. I could watch it again right now. I mean, to start out, uh, it has the it has the wonderful like late '80s '90s uh, action movie, the giant letters flying into the screen. Uh, very circa Total Recall and Terminator. With the just the music in the background, yeah, um, yeah, and they also uh, they also waste absolutely no time whatsoever on little character setup or anything until the plot literally starts with the aliens just showing up. Spoiler alert: <laughs> This movie is about aliens. If you haven't seen Independence Day by now, I can't help you. Also, spoiler alert: The planet Earth does not have any ability to see past the moon because this gigantic ship is only seeing. They were hiding on the dark side. Somebody forgot to call Pink Floyd. I was happy to see SETI going in there. Um, the only other real movie that I've really seen with SETI. With the night guy listening to End of the World as we know it. Surprisingly, the only real sa- or song uh, on the soundtrack, everything else uh, was instrumental. I did not notice that. Yeah, everything that I saw. Uh, I, I actually looked up with the soundtrack, and that was the only song song. But yeah, the only the only other uh, love that SETI has ever gotten that I've seen was in the uh, movie Contact with Jodie Foster. Also a good movie. Before we go any further, though, it is worth mentioning that during our time as defense contractors, Aaron and I were satellite network engineers. So when it comes to satellites in this movie, <laughs> their capabilities, yes. their... We, we could make an entire podcast of just talking about satcom inconsistencies in media but nobody wants to listen to that or, or even just the president of the united states looking solemnly saying you're talking line of sight <laughs> <laughs> and now i'm sad that i forget i forgot about that line because i would have totally used that in real life a few times also to clear things up we worked on the satellite antennas we did not work on the satellites that would have been a very long commute to work every day i got that a lot so you work on satellites? Yeah. We have a really big ladder. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun working at teleports, though. Working at the teleports, though, you know, going in and actually seeing uh, the, gig- the gigantic dishes. Yeah, those giant earth terminals were really cool. Where you see a, a cut scene in the movie where they're, they're you know, relocating their dish that in, in high speed, when in all actuality, to move that sucker 15 feet takes... 15 hours, you know, it's, and then in, in the air itself, reposition these satellites. Yeah, it doesn't really work that way. Exactly. But I digress. We're here to talk about the movie, not the inconsistent use of SATCOM technology. Well, let me, let me segue into Robert Loja is awesome. That, that man has been in many movies. He's the, he's the four-star general, four-star Marine Corps general. Also the, the coach in Necessary Roughness. I think he was the, the, the boss in Big. Ah, yes. The piano dance. Yeah, he has a very identifiable voice. You'd recognize him without even seeing him. Yeah, apparently uh, Roland Emmerich gave him uh, homework in order to, uh, uh, to prepare for his role, and he told him to watch Airport, uh, the thriller for, uh, about a you know, terrorist and stuff at, at, at an airport and the chaos and stuff. But he mistakenly watched Airplane. And then he refused to come out of his trailer because he, he didn't want to be in a spoof movie. <laughs> that is by far the best origin story for an actor. 
for a role that I've ever heard. But they introduce his character great because it, you've got a, a four star him and a two star army general walking towards the door, and the four star stops and just looks at the two star. The two star is played by the dad from the Wonder Years, and and he hesitates. He's like, "Oh crap!" Yeah, and then he opens the door. <laughs> that, that was uh, uh, the, 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 that was general officers in a nutshell, right there. I loved it. That is comically accurate. <laughs> Because then that two star is going to stare down a, a full bird and be like, "Where's my door?" <laughs> and it just keeps rolling downhill. I will say, rewatching this uh, definitely brought back some memories from watching it the first time. The intro with uh, when the saucers separate from the mothership, the camera is basically looks like it's mounted on the surface of the mothership, and you see all the all the small sh- mm-hmm. smaller battleships breaking apart and then all rotating around to show that they're discs in one move. That was really nice. Uh, one thing I did notice later in the movie is if these, if all these saucers were basically mounted on the outside of the mothership, when we saw the actual outside of the mothership later in the movie, I didn't notice any actual like mounting points for anything. Everything was yeah, you're right. relatively not for not smooth. You think, yeah, you think there would have been little craters. Yeah. Just little disc-sized uh, USB ports, basically. That's what I was expecting. That, that would have cost more money, and they couldn't get Fruitopia or Coke to sponsor the mothership. That, and uh, I'm sure somebody had a uh, patent on a uh, UFO-shaped docking clamp that they would have had to obtain rights for. And then when they finally enter the atmosphere, just I remember it from the original uh, scene watching the trailers, where they only really show maybe bits and glimpses of the the spaceships in the trailer. You see a lot of the fiery storm cloud that is created as they're entering the atmosphere and maybe one or two shots that actually show pieces of the spaceship from completely upward angle. And then they're in the, it's completely covering the background over the buildings as they're being blown up in the trailer. And that's as far as the trailer God, that was one of the things that was kind of cool about the trailer is it didn't touch on the plot at all. It just touched on the destruction. The, the trailer, the trailer built some great suspense. Just in, it, it was all set up. It was a te- all it was, was a teaser at that point. Cause nobody knew what, what the plot of the movie was going or to be. At, they at the just very knew minimum, the white at house some was point, the white house was getting I don't, blown up. I don't remember seeing any explosions in the trailer. Did they? I think they. I think it exploded. I think that was the end of the trailer. Uh, I will say, like for for Act One of this movie, which is well, one mm-hmm. thing they did rather nicely was they broke up uh, the movie into the three acts. They did over the actual three days that the plot of the movie takes place: July second, July third, July fourth, and they they do that pretty evenly. And I think that does really well. With Act One basically being the destruction of the major city, the first destruction of the major city. Well, cities. I think that's. Well, I think the act one is, is the setup itself, you know, the placing of the chess pieces and then the destruction is the start of act two mm-hmm. or the end of act one. That's the transition point where you've, then you've got the, the aftermath and then say mm-hmm. July 4th is the counterattack. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, it just seemed like it, it lined up very well. Every time the, the date would fly up, July 2nd would be equating to starting act one, July 3rd would be act two, et cetera. I, I could have done without the jarring transitions to New York. It was just white screen, boom, Statue of Liberty. White screen, boom, you know, New York. They just seemed out of place uh, yes. for a otherwise excellently paced first act, you know, where they took the time to sit down in in Central Park with Jeff Goldblum and his dad mm-hmm. to talk about chess and and just that that great exposition over that chess match where you find out everything about that father son duo, you know, that he's smart, he's divorced, he loves his dad, he loves the environment. You know, you find all of this out in just a few excellent lines of dialogue. Although the uh, Judd Hirsch's cigar length does change back and forth throughout that whole conversation, but yeah, that, that, that's a small nitpick. We have a, yeah, there's a couple of things. One of the things I really liked about that act one sequence is just, I would say probably the star of act one, aside from the buildings blowing up, which was pretty cool especially for 1996 was just the the setup of seeing the ships appear the sh- the giant shadows being cast uh, in agreed. the long and shots the, over the entire cities the monuments i think that was done that, really well and that very slow scene where the satellite itself slowly runs into the mothership 
And to anyone who's never actually seen a satellite on the ground, I mean, these things are not tiny. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the satellite itself, the, the center, you're talking, you know, the size of a, you know, a Greyhound bus. And then, then you've got the solar panels on the side. These things are, are huge to, to a human. Uh, so do you see it just gradually, gradually get smaller? Mm-hmm. And then you just, it, the scene lasts, you probably five to 10 seconds longer than you think it would. And then it finally hits with this tiny little explosion in the distance just to show the massive size of that mothership. I will say they did. And they had a couple issues with the perspectives of the ships where like some of the shots from below where they were trying to show the mothership, like passing over it as far, as high up as the ships are supposed to be, their perspective on it changes a little too much as if it was closer. So uh, there's a little off on there. And then there were obvious other ones where the size that they were describing these battleships, it wasn't the mothership, ship, uh, these, the battleships that broke off of it, the size that they were describing them as, which was around 15 miles, they were depicting them over when they went to wider shots and showed them over entire cities. If you look at the actual mapping of those cities, I, in some shots, a 15-mile ship should encompass a hell of a lot more than what it's actually showing. For example, in the scene where Will Smith comes out of his house, and picks up the paper and he notices everybody around him is they're like packing up and moving out. And he hasn't figured out why yet until he looks forward and sees a 15 mile ship, you know, what appears to be 20 miles away. But if it was really Los Angeles, that ship should have been over directly over his house, something like that. I'll allow it. Cause that was a pretty cool reveal scene. It was a great shot. It just, it throws the numbers off a little bit. Well, the, the, also the approach of those ships is way off as far as, the, the way they said they, we've got two over the Atlantic and they're headed towards New York and D.C. And then they show the shadows coming up over D.C. and the, the Washington Monument and Lincoln Memorial. They're, the shadows are coming from the wrong direction. And, and, I, and I would assume New York may have a similar thing. I'm not, more, I'm not familiar the wrong with direction. the you know, geographic layout yeah. of New York as far as the shadows go. Uh, but the one over there in the desert, there was one over the Pacific and it headed towards L.A. But yet... They shows them all in the Imperial Valley, which is in southeast of, of Los Angeles. In the uh, it's a border town in the desert. So yeah, those, so, so that's so the shadows come from the wrong direction. But that's uh, that's more nitpicking. Yeah, and now that you're mentioning it, I want to say in in the scene where they're watching the Russian news, uh, where it was the really grainy news. It was the first video that anybody was seeing of one of the ships arriving. And at the end of the news, Russian newscast, they jump back to a map and you can hear the English dubbing over it of them talking about one of the ships heading to Moscow. I want to say there were two ships on that diagram. I may be misremembering it, um, but I want to say there were two ships on that diagram that, that were moving into two different locations. But since these ships came from the same mothership, they should have been moving roughly in the same direction not coming from two different directions to reach Russia, unless they both went around the planet in opposite directions to meet there. The same map also had Berlin as like a mile from Moscow. Wait, Berlin's not a mile from Moscow? Well, that whole area is, you know, the size of the Eastland Mall. So it's, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they get for using the metric system. Um, I thought it was funny. Uh, when uh, uh, David's assistant, when uh, after he's discovered the signal and he's talking to his assistant who, you know, was hiding under his desk. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's been in a lot of things. But he's, uh, he's talking to his mom, trying to uh, ask her why, uh, what he wants to do. Yeah, the guy from Mrs. Doubtfire. I haven't seen that in so long. I'll t- have to take your word for it. Yeah, uh, yeah I, got, I got to call my mother. But he has, yeah, he has that line. I got to call my brother. I got to call my housekeeper. I got to call my lawyer and eh, forget my lawyer. The line where he says, and yeah. eh, forget my lawyer sounds different. He, yeah, you, swear, you can tell that was dubbed. <laughs> yeah. I swear he's, eh, fuck my lawyer. And they're like, no, yeah, the, we already used the F bomb. We want to keep, and we want to keep it a PG 13. Did they use an F bomb in there? Maybe they didn't. Um, uh, was that maybe prior to the one F bomb rule for the PG 13, but you can tell they redubbed hmm. that. I'm just, I'm Oh yeah. That, was, that was obvious ADR in the background. Yeah. That was, mm. uh, that was, that was <laughs> galaxy quest level of obvious. 
Uh, particularly like the uh, the warning to Los Angelinos, uh, please don't fire guns at the giant spaceship. You may, may inver- inadvertently trigger an interstellar war. <laughs> Which, I mean, if you want to nitpick, it would just be a uh, war. It wouldn't be interstellar because we wouldn't be fighting anybody from another st- uh, in another star system. Well, what, I don't know. How high were those ships supposed to be from the ground? I don't think any small arms fire is going to reach from the ground to that ship. You're just going to be raining bullets on yourselves. Also, yes. I don't know if they ever said. I don't know if they ever uh, said. It's obviously taller than what was it? The Chrysler, but not the Chrysler building. The taller than the Empire State Building because it was hovering over the Empire State Building. Yeah. I don't know if you could tell from perspective how much higher, even story wise. But that was probably. And the I don't know the name of that building in L.A. that it hovered over. The one with obvious no know. security where they let anybody with a sign and a short skirt up to the top. I don't either, but I want to go there now. <laughs> you had me at skirt. <laughs> I do have some notes here military-wise about the beginning because you got the, the scene on the sub. Uh, and these are nitpicks, but the Persian Gulf does not fall under Atlanticom. falls under CENTCOM. They, they should have reported their sighting to CENTCOM, and that should have went through to the Pentagon. But that's, that's small. Uh, but I'll give full credit to the uniforms. The uniforms in this movie were pretty spot on. I mean, I was zeroing in on those and accurate awards, accurate layouts, accurate combat patches, uh, and a lot of combat patches for the mid '90s. So you're, you're talking, uh, you know, the, the Kosovo area and uh, uh, maybe some Haiti. Desert Storm, yeah. But I did get I did get a chuckle when it just said Northern Desert Iraq, and it had the most stereotypical version of Iraqis nomading the desert. <laughs> it's like I, that's not what I remember from Northern Iraq. Yeah, and that wasn't the only stereotypical one uh, near the end where they were recruiting everybody via, via quote-unquote trope Morse code. They flashed to, I believe, another Iraqi air base with the British. And then the next scene, I want to say, was the French, who were, of course, in a castle in the rain, smoking cigarettes and eating croissants <laughs> while they were talking. And then well, the Americans saved they, the world. Yeah, and as they flashed over to Russia... You can hear the the ID4 theme song in the background change to like a Russian version of itself. Oh, really? To right. make sure <laughs> everybody knows we are in Mother Russia now. <laughs> I'm kind of curious with the um, the light panel helicopter, what language they were attempting to communicate with this completely foreign alien entity with using those light panels. So obviously we've seen this done in a couple of movies uh, since then and maybe even before then. The one that I've heard the most about is, say, the movie The Arrival with how they were depicting how uh, what uh, first communication with a completely alien en- entity might be. And then this light panel thing, uh, I'm not sure what they were trying to accomplish because it wasn't – you would think maybe binary would be the easiest thing to go with. One zero kind of thing, but they were they appear to be just sending random random light flashes. See what comes to mind for me is is close encounters of the third kind at the end with the the lights and the music. Mm-hmm. But now I'm picturing you know aliens landing outside my house and trying to communicate me with a gigantic strobe light. You know I'm going to look at them like they're goddamn morons. And see, by far the best first contact uh, communication signal that I've ever seen is uh, John Fogarty. Ooby Dooby from uh, Star Trek. I need to unfriend you for that. Was that Roy Orbison? It's Roy Orbison. Okay. I literally just looked that up because I couldn't remember who it was. John Fogarty. That's what came up when I searched Ooby Dooby. Uh, Ooby Dooby is Roy Orbison classic. Best version. Yeah. Well, it's not a, It's not the top fa- uh, top list on it. I'll tell you that much. Zephron Cochran knows, knows the right one. And, and besides, the best first contact is always going to be Mars Attacks. The international sign of the donut. At, at. And it's worth mentioning on this, since we're still talking about the motherships and, and all that, it's obvious that these ships coming into atmosphere over all these major places of this size would be environmentally, you know, the, the earth would be wrecked already. These things would be causing tidal waves, actual earthquakes, not the, the Will Smith tremor you know, that he mentions. These things would yeah. be causing havoc. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Even just the, crazy the flaming walls. For the size of that mothership, just the mothership without the battleships would have affected the gravitational pull 
Yeah, uh, yeah, that'll screw up the moon and quite everything. Quite possibly throwing off, yeah, quite possibly throwing off the moon as well. But this movie does a great job with establishing the you know suspension of belief through their storytelling. Yeah, you know, it's it's only on uh, you know the, the second or fiftieth rewatch that you're like, man, the, this would cause problems. Well, do we want to talk about the like say the intro of all the main characters? Sure. So so first we get President Lone Star and married to President Roslin. Young. They hold off and don't go directly into it. They just jump to Lone Star in a bed talking to Roslyn, who's at a hotel somewhere. And they don't, uh, and then as he turns on the TV while they're bad mouthing the president, who we haven't actually revealed that he's the president yet. And again, from the trailers, uh, at least the initial trailers, no, none of the characters are really introduced. As who yeah, they I should have are. watched the trailer before this. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Bill Pullman is in the trailer, but not. Uh, it's not apparent that he's the president. It isn't until he gets up and walks out that that he's greeted, and you understand who he is. I, I did see one moment though at, after that. Uh, so he, they they introduce us to those two. He walks out in the hallway, meets his chief of staff, who I don't know her name, um, but she, you know they're going back and forth as far as his. his his agenda and, and his policies and stuff. Then he gets a call and, it, and it's, and I don't know if it was intentional or if it was, uh, you know, just a, a little character choice. Uh, but he, he's got a phone call. He walks over to the phone and then they say it's the Pentagon. And as he picks it up, the president himself, who is a former uh, pilot, military pilot, he snaps to attention before he picks up that phone. Ah, it's a nice yeah, little cue. Uh, yeah. And then he answers it and then he's, then he shrugs, what did you Can say, you say you know, that it, again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that was just a nice little character touch of, you know, once you're military, you're always military. And it's, a, it's the Pentagon, sir. And he, 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 he straightens up and snaps up. And then when it comes to his Oval Office later, he has the same Oval Office as Bartlett down to the artwork. Did not realize that. We recently rewatched all the West Wing again. So that was fresh in my mind. And I saw those paintings and I got to Googling. Makes me wonder if they changed the rug on the floor so the eagle the rug is pointing is the other way. I don't know if that's a myth or not. <laughs> it's a myth. From what I, from everything I've read, that's an absolute sorkin. But if Fitzwallace says it, it's true. Fair enough. And then we have the uh, intro of uh, Will Smith and was it Vivica A. Fox? Vivica A. Fox and their and their son Dylan. And as soon as he gets up, basically um, immediately puts on the dog tags with no shirt to immediately establish him, establish him as a military man. I will say this, and it's not my position to question anyone's parenting, but these two are still sleeping and they've got a six slash seven year old running wild outside. And they're just inside sleeping first thing in the morning. Who's watching this kid. You just described my entire childhood in LA. Well, not my entire childhood. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not questioning the, the strippers parenting at all. Not how I would have done it. It's okay. He was out fighting aliens. But I, I do uh, have an issue with the trope of the military girlfriend getting all pissed off about the, the soldier being called back from leave. That, that, that one rubs me the wrong way every time I see it. You know, to me, when uh, you, you get involved with a military person, there is a, there is a, a higher duty that you need to accept. And you can't get all pissed off, especially when there's a goddamn alien mothership and your boyfriend's a fighter pilot. You know, I know emotions are high and everything, et cetera, but get over it. He's got to go do his job. Yeah, that one's kind of up. And her getting all pissed yes. off, that she, she, she rubbed me the wrong way right from the very beginning with that scene. I'm not a big fan of her character throughout the movie. Her parenting, too. <laughs> Let's not uh, also forget to mention the obvious trope of the uh, military fighter pilot dating the stripper because that never happens. Yes, military never dates strippers. Never. No. <coughs> Lejeune. Un, un, unheard of. So, and then uh, after Mr. Hiller, Captain Hiller, Will Smith, meets up with his right hand man, the lovely Harry Connick Jr. It was nice to see Harry in there. Uh, and have their little, ah, uh, yes. Uh, they have their funny little scene in the locker room. The pseudo homoerotic Harry Connick Jr. proposing to Will Smith when the other guy walks in. He's like, well, you guys do your thing. He was That's hilarious. I, I thought his, his little sidekick shtick was, was 
mm-hmm. was great. The, the, the whole, yeah, the, yeah, the whole, the whole reverend proposal thing. thing was, was funny. And the, uh, just as a, a supporting reverend. character, it's a shame. Will Smith immediately forgot about him when he dies. Mm-hmm. Let alone, obviously the best friend fighter pilot is going to die. Oh yeah. He was doomed from the beginning and he's going to die. And he's going to die attempting something that he obviously shouldn't. As soon as he started doing it, Will Smith was like, don't you do that. You can't do X while Y. Doesn't matter what he says, but. I assume there's some sort of aviation flight maneuver he was trying to do that was wrong. And then and, and he, and he wouldn't have been able to, to get out. I don't, I don't know. I, that's it, it was. Uh, yeah. And what Will Smith said was that he was basically telling me he can't bank at that speed. Is that, okay, that's what it From was. the actual video, it didn't look like he was banking very hard. It obviously caused him a lot of uh, distress and breathing, which apparently when you're not breathing, uh, you, forget to, you forget to outmaneuver the alien spacecraft and get shot. Yeah, if you're having trouble taking in oxygen, take off your oxygen mask. <laughs> yes. Also, yeah. Yeah, they're, when they're walking to their flights, though, uh, it, there was a, a, a line that bugged me. You had Will Smith... Calling him soldier. You will never uh, find a, a Marine pilot calling another Marine pilot a soldier. It's just not going to happen. It's not what Marines do. No. A soldier is, is Army, and a Marine will tell you the same thing. But when they're flying, he calls them Marine. You know, That's an order Marine. So that, yeah. there, was, there was just that one line of uh, it, it was in jest because it was all about the cigar. You know, the, the, you know, don't light that up yet. Don't jinx it. I do remember after uh, the good reverend gets blown up, for banking too hard. Uh, and Will Smith is riding through all the canyons trying to escape the one final uh, alien ship. He looks down and sees that his uh, fuel gauge is, or his fuel is running low. But if you actually watch the fuel gauge, it's got a percentage readout that's literally psyching 100 down to zero, 100 down to zero, 100 down to zero. I didn't catch that. So complete random graphics just to make it look like it's running faster than it is. So. But I thought that that was a nice, uh, a nice continuity touch, though, as far as he does run out of fuel, mm-hmm. and he ends up what like two hundred miles away from L.A. in the middle of the of Death Valley, mm-hmm. in, in between you know Ben Lake and, and L.A. Yeah. Somehow they missed Fort Irwin. They, I mean, Fort Irwin's out there somewhere. They may miss. Fort I don't Irwin. think anybody misses Fort Irwin. Barstow. Everyone needs to spend time in Barstow. Uh. That's for you, bud. <laughs> Uh, I I also like how uh, with the issue with being able to get any uh, can't get any shots, missiles, ammunition, or anything through their shields. He basically kills them with concussion against the rock. So, and he actually didn't. And that kill dog them. fight through the canyon was pretty pretty badass. It was definitely good, and especially good for '96. That was done very well. Yeah. Well, it, well, and we forgot one of the main people with which is uh, you know Dr. Jeff Goldblum. We, we we did speak about his his uh, intro with the chess scene, which was it, it, probably my favorite scene in the movie. The the chess scene, I, I just like the way they they talk uh, and the whole chess. Yeah, yes. the, the chess metaphor comes up throughout the movie, which is a great callback. What what is his job actually? I mean, it sounds like from what I can tell, he works for a TV broadcast company, possibly one of the major television broadcasters and runs the communications department on it basically dealing because his dad aspects. looks down on him for what he does i guess he's got a brilliant mind from mit but he works for like i say a, just a just a tv channel or something yeah which goes to a tiny bit of character progression for for judd hirsch towards the end where he's i'm proud of you it's one of well he thinks he's sure certain that he can he could do more with as much mm-hmm. with as smart as he is he knows he could do more and he he thinks he's kind of wasting his mind away doing this menial, running a TV TV station type job. Which you could say he kind of is wasting away mm-hmm. if he's got that this level of intelligence. However, it worked out in the end for you know planet Earth. All he was trying to do was save the planet, and it gave him the ability to search a phone book for his ex wife's phone number and triangulate. That's one thing that uh, people, if they ever are new kids, if they rewatch the movie today, are not going to understand the concept of a busy signal on a cell phone. When he tries to call her and it's in use because he gets a busy signal, he's like, oh, good, it's in use. I can triangulate it. I can triangulate it so I can park right out in front of the damn White House. Also something that kids today won't understand. What do you mean you can park in front of the White House? You couldn't do that then. (laughs) 
Not not to worry. It's like she, yo, look out the window and wave. Hi, I'm here. No, that's that's some, that's some the beating loading right zone there. is for loading and unloading only. I mean, I used to do it all the time. I don't know what you're talking about. I was impressed with his wall of TVs in his office, though. That 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 for '96 that. All the all the old school CRTs as well. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean there was probably thirty TVs on that wall. And let's not forget the best the best cameo in this movie by far, Lieutenant Commander Data, as the wily haired crazy scientist from Area Fifty One. Is Data better than Jane? The <laughs> man they call Jane. Jane. <laughs> I would say yes because Adam Baldwin is always Adam Baldwin. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Data is n- rarely a crazy Wiley scientist. That reminds me of Dr. Wiley from Sonic the Hedgehog. I could see that. Yeah, you could tell Brett Spiner was having a blast in that role, just overacting as much as he could. Yeah, the, the exact opposite of what he's used to. Uh, whereas, yeah, Adam Baldwin is pretty much Adam Baldwin, everything I've ever seen him in. Jane Cobb being s- uh, the slightly dumber, dumbed down version of it. But still the same character. He's still got the same evil, like, meanish look. Like, don't say anything wrong or I'm just going to punch you from across the room kind of thing. But Officer Jane in this movie is a, is a master of all. He's, a, uh, he's an XO. He's a security commander. He's an aviation instructor. He's a sharpshooter. He's, he's everything that every airman wants to be. Like I said, he's Jane. He's Jane. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I was kind of curious about, and maybe... Because I, I didn't uh, get a chance to rewatch it, but while they were doing the alien autopsy on the alien that Will Smith had knocked out with one punch, who had stayed unconscious for oh, well over three hours while he drug him through the desert, which, A, props on Will Smith for having a hell of a punch. They were autopsying him. They were basically – I can't recall if they said uh, – they said that the, the aliens were basically uh, – like you and me, like when they showed the three that were in the uh, the glass jars, for lack of a better term, uh, and he was yeah. explaining they're organic, they're like you and me, their bodies are just as frail as ours. It's the technology, the suits that they wear that make them a lot more formidable. When they were autopsying them, it looked like they were cutting into organic material and basically opening it up and reaching in, and yet the alien's still alive. He's basically, you see us tentacles or his hand fingers start curling like uh oh he's about to wake up and kill everybody you would think if they were actually cutting into his organic material he would kind of be in pain we know they don't have vocal cords so he's not going to be screaming but you think he'd be doing more than just laying in wait as he's being cut into and the only thing that i can think of is that their suits that they're in very much resemble organic material as well at least us i think that's probably the best way to go i mean we don't know their you know, to get into the, the, the techie details of their interstellar travel and mm. what they need to do, uh, what they breathe and, and all that. Which they did. They breathe oxygen, which is one of the reasons they thought they postulated that they okay. were interested in, the, in Earth uh, was it was the same same atmosphere so they could reap the rewards of it. But it, it, it's interesting to me that these suits that they're in appear very organic in nature. They're, you know, they're all slimy and slick. And then you look at their vehicles and they're the complete opposite. Um, they're very pretty much, I mean, I can see it being done that way from an imagery perspective for the movie to make them look more, a little more menacing. Same with the outside of the battleships and the mothership. Very reminiscent of if you look at the walls of the trench run from Star Wars, it was just a lot – nothing was smooth. It was all things jutting out all over the place just to make it look busier. It kind of reminded me of, of the Borg, but just mm-hmm. with – in saucer rather than the cube. Yeah. And again, if you're, if you're flying in space, you don't have to worry about the aerodynamics of having a non-smooth surface. Uh, then again – and then I guess maybe these things fly uh, – don't have to worry about that with the shields while they're in atmosphere. If the shields basically create that smooth aerodynamic surface – which is why they're still able to fly so fast. It could be. Which makes me wonder if they fly worse if you turn the shields off. They start catching a lot of wind resistance on all those jutting out or you know rough edges of the ship. That's true. That could that could be. So l- let's talk about the actual explosions, the attack. So those those were goddamn awesome. They they, they still hold up today as far as the impressive. I, mean, I know it's all models. Yeah. And, and man man they crushed it. 
I would put that right under the Terminator 2 apocalypse dream sequence as far as big scale cities being destroyed scenes. It was pretty good. And 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 the biggest reason why I think is because it was all models. It wasn't CGI. You knew for a fact something actually blew up. This wasn't just a a, a computer rendered model. This was this was real life. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the the actual explosion, the wave of fire, you know, there's always the the famous dog and uh, stripper in the tunnel. They they'd be fried. Mm, yeah, the dog who's completely unfazed. Yeah, the dog who's yeah. completely unfazed by anything happening around him, including the giant fireball running at him, who happens to just barely miss it. That and Air Force One. Air Force One was toast. There's no way that plane would have got off the ground. But the the, the wall of fire right behind it, and an airplane yeah. taken off. Yeah, you know, I'm not a master of avionics, but that there's no 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 way. I'm actually else. curious what the I was trying to find out what the what the takeoff speed of one of those jets was so that we could clock the the rate of expansion on that firewall because it was basically expanding at the same rate as Air Force One was flying or was taxing at time of takeoff. So if we knew that, we could know how fast that giant wall of fire was moving. The wall of fire looked pretty amazing. The one thing that was missing in my mind was the shock wave of an explosion. It didn't it didn't act like it was an explosion. It literally acted like it was like say a napalm firebomb that just happened to keep getting bigger. You didn't get the shock wave or anything. People weren't blown down. That's true. At the explosion it literally was just like a cloud of flame. So, and maybe that was on purpose because it's obviously something alien and maybe they know how to do that. Maybe they have a light based napalm style weapon <laughs> and that's how it works. Wait, you're not an expert on alien weapon technology? Give me a week. My kids were coming in and out of the room uh, throughout the movie and my, my four year old daughter uh, happened to catch part of that. And her only comment was, I hope the trees are safe. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but them trees is gone. Yeah. Well, yeah, the there were the, the models were were great. Uh, I, whoever, whatever company put those to work and 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 built those, great job. Absolutely. I wish more movies did stuff like that today. That's that's a lost art. The, then there was the obvious trope of the alien ship that they have in captivity in Area Fifty One, which hasn't worked in twenty thirty years. I can't remember when they said it crashed. It was in the fifties or sixties. I want to say it was the 60s. It was the 50s, the Roswell incident. Okay, so 30, 40 years. They, they say different things in the movie. They, they, they keep, one of the guys, I swear, said crash landed back in the 50s. And then the president's like, you've had this thing for 20 years. And I'm like, well, that <laughs> math doesn't work. And you're the leader of the free world. Well, to be fair, he just found out about it. <laughs> he didn't just find out about math. Ooh, math. Uh, <laughs> Not even once. <laughs> but that ship's been sitting there uh, as a pile of wreckage, and then everything starts turning on right as the mothership starts showing up, as if the alien power, and you see this trope a lot. This was in Avengers. This was in Star Wars prequels where all the robots were controlled by the control ship. You take out the control ship, and all the soldiers are dead. Yeah, the hive mind sort of Yeah, or the, control. the hive power supply. It, yeah, at least they these guys kind of did it. I want to say first, but they did it before all those really agreed. They, but it's definitely a, a shortcut. Yeah. But, but, but with such they a, had to ex- uh, it's, it's such a massive scale of, of this whole invasion, that's really the only way out they could have written. It, and it also explains why they weren't able to <laughs> do anything with the ship. I'm kind of curious how far off when they decided to nuke, uh, shoot a nuke at the ship over Houston. Uh, and then they had the, the spotter vehicle, pull up what appeared to be on like a highway exit ramp. I wonder how far away they were. That, that's a scene that, that highlighted the, the secretary of defense and what a jackass he was. Cause as soon as that explosion went off, you know, he, he jumps out of his seat. He's like, yeah, we got him. And then as soon as he's proven wrong, but wait, uh, we, we don't know that the next one won't have the same effect. He, he's literally just, he's the antagonist in every scenario. He's the sleazy rat guy. He does it very consistently. Uh, he's the guy that knows about Area 51 that obviously hasn't told anybody because of his job, even when all the damn aliens show up. Yeah, he's a, he's a pretty piss poor Secretary of Defense. Yeah. 
But on the upside, he didn't have to be that way for long. He's also not Jewish, as we find out. Yeah, my, my little trope list here, uh, to, to go down a couple real quick, uh, keys in the visor. She yeah. finds the keys in the visor of the truck. Person talking about motion sickness on Air Force One makes somebody else sick. Uh, <laughs> we can go up, we can go down, we can go back, we can go forth, we can go side to side. Yeah. But, but he does follow up with the whole, uh, all, you need is, all, all you need is love. John Lennon, uh, smart man. John Lennon, smart man. Shot in the back, very sad. <laughs> the jump scare during the alien autopsy. Conversations right next to a running helicopter. As we both know, that is impossible. It's it's hard enough to get uh, conversations <laughs> over comm equipment in a helicopter, yeah. let alone without it. The first lady, she survives just long enough to, for the doctors to say they can't do anything. Mm-hmm. And then the ticking clock. Yeah, that, that's my trope list. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those uh, are covers for mine. I, I had also the uh, – when they got to the mothership and were ready to launch – the uh, the virus attack instead of literally like hitting a button or hitting enter on something he literally brings up a window types in three paragraphs of co- what appears to be programming code like on the fly and hits enter like have that stuff staged yeah he's it a looks like he coder. typed it all I know he that was fast it didn't even take him like three key clicks and he had the entire page it, and he even had time to to name the program the jolly roger jolly roger yeah uh, and and he had to program in there the the little bar oh, 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 oh. yeah and the, the the skull and crossbones i mean that's impressive all on an apple power book he was a good callback to see uh david's laptop running mac os system 7 which brought back some uh wonderful memories do you think that power book would have been able to boot up with the uh, hello dave Oh, I mean, mine did. I don't know which. <laughs> In 96? How am I telling? Yes. Hell yeah. My IBM Aptiva in 1996 was a, was a piece of shit. So, <laughs> I, I, Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I had a uh, 286 back then. I just know it took me four CD-ROMs to play Myst. So whatever he was doing on that power book was impressive. That, and then that leads into the American Save the World plan. Which, as tropey and uh, as as cliche as it is, I enjoyed it. I thought it yeah. was funny. It's about buddy time. What that? What do they suggest? And, uh, yeah, and that's that's that whole montage of stereotypical looking as possible in every other location in the world. They want to make sure you know they're in Middle East, they're in France, they're in Russia, they're in Iraq, for example. But but then you've also got. The U.S. command, who is in, in a secondary base, we've got our president, we've got our secretary of defense, we've got our chairman of the Joint Chiefs, we've got people still, we've got resources, we've got technology, and then it cuts over to random places around the world, and they're, they've already been reduced to tents and what looked like middle officers in their late 20s. Yeah, that, that's, all the, that's all the Russians and the British had left yeah. to, to enforce this plan. Which kind of makes me wonder, it brings me to one of my questions about this movie, is uh, if you believe uh, good old Randy Quaid, uh, that they have been uh, experimenting on humans for years to find out their weaknesses and everything, do, uh, do you think the aliens did any kind of like uh, force recon to determine the best strike points? They had to have known some things uh, because they took out they took out NORAD. Yeah, that was my thing. Uh, uh, NORAD would be. A- and if they would have went for the population centers, they wouldn't have went for D.C. I think Chicago and Miami have higher populations than D.C. You got you know New York and L.A. Obviously, those are easy ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how? I mean, they, they really don't go into how the recon of you know probing Randy Quaid. Which, by the way, this this segment here is the first time we've mentioned Randy Quaid. This that is time. true. <laughs> Forgot all about that. They don't really go into how is there a cloaking ship? You know, how would these other how would they get Randy Quaid with the current ships that we've seen? They've they've been pretty obviously gigantic. Uh, even the even the even the little cruisers that uh, they fly back to the mother mothership is still a big ship. Yeah, I'm inclined to believe that Mr. Russell Case never did get abducted. I think that is all in his head. It just happens to be his own personal motivation. Well, he he is yeah. a Vietnam pilot. He's he's likely yeah. got some PTSD and he's got some issues. But well, but he he is the only main character I would say that has an arc. You know, that has a firm arc because he starts off as a 
a, a drunken slob, and in the very end, he is, he is redeemed. The, he is the man. He, he is redeemed in the eyes of his kids uh, or stepkids. I don't, I don't know if that's ever really defined. But he's, he, he has a full arc and comes around as, a, as a, a good guy. Yeah, now that you mention it, I don't think anybody else really changed much. You, you could argue that Jeff Goldblum and Judd Hirsch maybe a little. Get a little closer. But, but largely they're the same people as when the movie started. Like the, the scene with him handing him the Bible mm-hmm. and the kippa, that was that was kind of nice, you know, just in case. And the, the speech at the end, the, uh, today we celebrate our Independence Day Oh, speech. yeah, we didn't even talk that, about the speech. That's still very excellent speech, well well given by Bill Pullman as well. I think he, I, he it, did a good job short, delivering. It's short, sweet, to the point, still gives you goosebumps. Mm-hmm. At the very end, as the as the credits are rolling, my my six year old son asked me, "Is there an after credits scene?" <laughs> oh, child! He's been spoiled by Marvel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, child! <laughs> Nobody watched the credits in the nineties. <laughs> no, <laughs> unless you personally knew somebody in the movie, everybody got up and left as soon as the credits started. <laughs> I think we should move on to our ranking system. Yeah, because that's that's pretty much what I got. So the way that we're going to be approaching our rating system is that Aaron and I will be giving a score of 1 out of 10, 10 being a perfect movie, 1 being absolute crap, 5 being an average run-of-the-mill movie. In order to make this fair, we're going to be adding in the IMDb score as a third person. So we'll take the average, and then we will uh, start keeping track of all these movies and make our gigantic mega list. So what's your rank on Independence Day? So uh, I'm going to give Independence Day a good, like, 7.8. Very rewatchable. Um, obviously dated just from the technology. Um, there's a lot of things from a plot perspective that wouldn't work out today uh, with new technology, and that might hinder new viewers being able to understand certain plot points, uh, a.k.a. the concept of the busy signal. But, you know, those are little minor points. The actual, the actual plot and the storytelling of it, I think, was very spot on. I'm going to go with a solid eight. Uh, I was really impressed with, with all of the special effects. I loved all the performances. And uh, despite a couple of nitpicks on, on the military side and the science side, it, it's just a, a thoroughly enjoyable movie. They, they really hit a home run with that one. And let's see, IMDb as our third person. IMDb is a solid 7.0. So we are right in the realm there. Yeah. And our composite score, 7.6. I'm good with that. Yeah, I'm very happy with that. With two movies down, that puts it at the top movie we've ever done. All right. I think we're uh, ready to uh, spin the wheel. Time to spin. Okay, we're going to do it right this time. All right. Big money, big money. No whammy, no whammy. Stop. 338. Oh, we got big numbers here. We're down in the... 338 is... W's? Do we have any W's? I'd like to buy a vowel. The Wedding Singer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, uh, we're, we're going, going smack into the 90s version of the 80s. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening, and we hope you stay with us through this little experiment. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Check out our website in the show notes to see the full list of movies we'll be covering and our rankings thus far. We'll see you next time on On Cinema Decon. Decon.